Um, today's workshop is making a web map with open source software. Um, and I am Becky Seyfried. I'm the geospatial information librarian here at UMass Amherst. Um, I have over the last couple of years gotten much more into QGIS, which is a free and open source GIS software. Um, in the last few years, it's become really quite an amazing and powerful piece of software that rivals everything, almost everything that ArcGIS can do. But of course, it's available and accessible to people who are working on Mac or Linux, um, and also people who don't want to pay the Esri fee to use ArcGIS. So we're going to be learning today how to make a web map using QGIS. And one of the many, many, many plugins that software developers have created for QGIS um, in order to do this very thing. So hopefully those of you who are here have some experience with QGIS already and some basic concepts about GIS. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about that today. Um, there are other workshops available on the website, um, including the Learn the Basics, if that is something you wanna go back and do on your own time. And <clears throat> we'll just get started. I guess I'm gonna share my screen. All right, if at any time something goes wrong and either my screen freezes or um, you can't, like it, I'm talking about something you cannot see, please feel free to unmute yourself and let me know when I'm in this screen sharing world, I sometimes don't see the chat um, or have a hard time. Thank you for that, Sasha. <laughs> I saw the chat that time. <laughs> Feel free also to interrupt me at any point if you have a question um, that's related to what I'm talking about or unrelated, we can, we can talk about it later. So what we're talking about here today is a two hour workshop on making an open source web map. And the basic kind of outline right here, we're doing introductions right now. And I'm gonna continue that for a few more minutes. We're then gonna talk about how to set up your map in QGIS, that's the first step to making a web map. Then we'll go through the steps of using the QGIS to web plugin. There are tutorials for this out there, which I've used in order to teach myself, and hopefully we'll be able to demonstrate that without too many problems live. Then we'll take a short break because this is a two hour workshop. I wanna make sure people can can get a break from this. Um, when we come back, we will then move on to the platform GitHub and learn how to publish that map. Um, and then hopefully there will be time at the end for you to do this yourselves. Um, and or if you have questions, um, we, can, we can also use that time to answer specific questions. But again, at any time you are welcome to ask me questions, just unmute yourself um, if I don't see your chat. All right, so again, this is the website that I put together. Um, we're going to start very briefly by talking about the difference between static maps and, and web maps. And the first question that I think I, I would recommend asking yourself is, if you have a story you want to tell in map form, what is the best way to do that? Static maps are a really great way we, to, to tell a story. We see them everywhere. We see them in, in printed articles. Um, we see them in journal papers and other kind of scientific publications. Um, they're a great thing to, meet, to make if you want to just post it on Twitter and get some likes. Um, so here's an example. I put together this data set um, because I'm a big fan of sunlight and we are kind of in this moment right now where <laughs> daylight savings time is kind of up for debate in Congress. So I thought this would be a timely topic to look into. Um, I will just come out there right away and say I am pro like sticking with daylight savings time forever because as this map will show you, I made the static map, um, basically showing what time the sun sets on the shortest day of the year, December 21st this past year, um, and how many people, I call this my map of darkness suffering, like how many people are, you know, living in these early sunset times on that shortest day of the year. Um, so we're over here in this dark corner of the U.S. And um, there are certainly some places in the U.S. where you probably aren't affected so much by the early sunset in December, like Texas and Florida and Georgia. Those are great places to be if you like the sun. Um, and so this could be an interesting infographic that I share with people, and it might accomplish everything that I want to accomplish, which is, for me, just to share with people 
no worries about being late. Welcome. <laughs> I'll repost the website link in the chat. All right, there it is. Um, yeah, so this would get across, you know, my point, which is pro daylight savings time. But what if I wanted to get people more interested in exploring this data? You know, this is not an interactive map. If somebody lived in Nebraska, they wouldn't be able to learn much more than they have a pink dot, which tells them sunset is between 5 and 5.15. That's not very precise. So what web maps allow us to do, if I click on that, is create an interactive version of this. Um, this is not, this is a draft that I made. Please do not judge <laughs> too harshly. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that now this person who lives in Nebraska could click on their city and find out more about it. So they can find out that sunset specifically is at 5, 10 p.m. on that shortest day of the year. They have 9.3 hours of daylight. Um, they're in the America Chicago time zone and it has the population and density. You know, I could customize this however I want to show what information I want to be in this pop-up. So people could click around on different cities. They could zoom in and explore some really interesting differences like here, um, just east of Chicago. We have Michigan City, Indiana, where the sun sets at 421. And not far away, Benton Harbor, Michigan, Michigan, where the sun sets a whole hour later. Fascinating. Um, some other things you can do with web maps are create kind of in, like responsive pop-ups, info panels, um, turning layers on and off. Um, I have some filters in here. So let's say... We wanted to just see the most populous cities. We could filter that out by population. Let's say we only want to see things in the America Chicago time zone. We can filter that out. Or alternatively, just everything in California. So these are some cool things we can do with web maps. I'm going to back. Zoom, zoom tools are in the way. Yeah, I'm going to click the back button. There we go. All right, so I have a, just a quick little um, kind of pro-con comparing the two versions to help you decide whether making a web app is really worth your effort, or worth, worth your time. I assume because you are here in this workshop, you think making a web map would be a really cool way to tell your story. Um, but just putting this out there, um, some pros and cons. I think that from my experience, putting these two different maps together, I'd say that web maps generally are more accessible, are more interesting, are more exciting ways to share your data. Um, the difference is that like making a static map, especially in terms of map composition is going to be a lot easier, especially if you've already gotten experience with a GIS software like QGIS, um, where you're used to creating a map and adding text and map elements through just like a, a button approach doing that in a web map is more complicated. And that's where using QGIS to web, that plugin makes that so much easier. It's much more of a kind of click button approach to creating a web map. It's also totally possible to design a web map from code using just coding expertise, which is not what this workshop is about. <laughs> it's beyond our skill level today. Um, but otherwise, I think static maps are, are, you know, kind of the less interactive, less exciting version, but they are easier to make. So today we're hoping to kind of tackle this. Well, let's think about an easier way to make a web map for us all. So on this website, there's also an exercise, which I'm going to kind of go through in real time right now um, for the rest of this workshop. But this layout is here if you want to go back and do it on your own time or in the last 30 minutes of the workshop when you have time to do this on your own. Um, it is not a thorough step-by-step -step tutorial, but it does have the general steps. So they're outlined here like step one, get some data. If you want to use the data I'm using, you can download that here. Um, make the data look nice is step two, install the plugin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I also want to just draw your attention to this step here, step four, which is use the QJS to web plugin. I did not create a step-by-step -step guide for this because there already is an excellent one um, that is just about this step. And so I highly recommend checking it out if you get stuck on that particular step. Um, here it is. Um, I can't recommend this website highly enough. It has a really amazing tutorials just about QGIS. And this one about the QGIS to web plugin is excellent. It has screenshots. 
they might look a little different from the most recent QGIS versions, but they the steps are basically the same already. Okay, so with that, I'm going to get started. Um, if you download the data set that I shared in the website um, and you unzip it, it will look like this, Sunlight Data Pack. There is a readme in there that just explains how I put this data together, where it came from. There is a CSV file. If you are interested in working straight from the source um, and you want to get some practice converting a CSV file into a shape file, you can do that. Uh, if you have a question about that at the end, I'm also happy to go through those steps. Um, but this is showing you the raw data that I used to create the shape file. So we have all of the city information that came from the Simple Maps US Cities database. And key within here, it has a latitude and longitude value for each of the cities. And these are the 1,000 most populated cities in the US. And it has um, other information like population and so on. And then it has the time zone, which turned out to be really like key for the next step. Uh, from there, I wrote a Python script, which is also available um, in the GitHub repo where all of this material is stored. There's a link in the readme text if you're interested in that script that I wrote. Uh, basically, it queried an API that had sunset times in it. So it was able to retrieve for each of these latitude longitude values, the sunrise, the sunset, um, and how long the day was, which I guess is here, day length. And I also did some things to convert it into human readable times that took into account the time zone. So what we're having here is like the local, you know, sunset times, um, which is super important. Oh, let me post that website one more time for folks who just came in. All right, cool. So these are the data that you can play with. There's a lot you could do with this data. You do not have to make a map just about sunlight. If you want to make a map that's exploring population, you can do that instead, or time zones or whatever you want. Um, night length, <laughs> and so on. Um, but I also made a shapefile out of this. If you're interested in just getting straight into mapping, um, there's a shapefile that's, uh, that's been cleaned up and I, I added a couple more fields to make it more fun. So we're going to start by launching QGIS. And again, if you need help um, installing QGIS, the link that Sasha posted in the chat, the Learn the Basics, has a step-by-step -step kind of tutorial for how to get QGIS onto your computer. I'm going to start with a new empty project. You might also have noticed that I'm running QGIS 3.22, which is the latest long-term release. I generally prefer to install those because they've been user tested and are less buggy. Um, it is also possible to install the most recent version. I don't, I can't remember what it is, maybe 3.24, um, which has more features, but is also kind of still, it still has the potential to be buggy. And since I'm leading a workshop live, I thought I didn't need that extra, <laughs> extra added potential things to go wrong. All right, so I'm going to add that shape file that I created into my session. All right, and we see here, this is a map of a bunch of cities in the United States. Um, one thing you might note if you start working from the CSV file, which is the full data set, it, it is the 1,000 largest cities in all of the United States, which includes Alaska and Hawaii and Puerto Rico. Um, and I removed those from the shape file because I wanted to make a map that was just the contiguous 48. So that's, that's why this one only has like 990 features, not 1,000. All right, so I added my shape file. Um, another thing that I like to do with QGIS is use the base map function. Um, this is a plugin that I recommend everybody install if you're running QGIS. We go to the plugin menu and search for quick map services. This is a great plugin. Oh, I see there's a new version available. Should I upgrade right now live? Maybe not, <laughs> but normally you would see an option to install the plugin. Once you install the Quick Map Services plugin, there is a menu that shows up in the top. Um, if you're working on a Windows machine, it might look a little different. I'm working on a Mac, but generally there should be a web menu and you'll see Quick Map Services. And the standard base maps that come with this are OSM and I think maybe the NASA layers. It's not very extensive. 
Um, and so you can just click that and say, I want to see the OSM base map. Isn't that amazing? Okay, that's super great. Another kind of hot tip is if you want to see more options, like you see, I also have access to the Google Maps and some cool maps like this weird watercolor map, which I'll show you, looks like that. Um, you can turn those on by going into the settings for Quick Map Services and clicking the More Services tab and click Get Contributed Pack. Um, and once you click that button and it's warning you, these are not validated, they're kind of just, you know, who knows where they came from. <laughs> you can go to the visibility tab and turn them on and off. So we can see that I've turned on a couple of the contributed packs. That lets me use other services as my base maps, like the Positron. That's a nice one. That's the one I used in the examples. Um, but for now, we'll use the OSM. All right. So we have our base map. The next step um, is to like think about how this is going to look in a web map. Um, right now, the United States looks a little squished, right? That's not the way we normally see the country kind of portrayed on a map. And that's because the projection has not been changed to, um, the coordinate system has not been changed to a projected version. We're looking at a geographic coordinate system in decimal degrees, um, which we can tell because down here, these are decimal degree values. So I'm gonna change my project coordinate system, this button in the bottom right corner. And we see it's right now highlighted on WGS 84. Um, the one that I'm gonna use for the purposes of this map is WGS 84 Web Mercator Auxiliary Sphere. This is a coordinate system that is basically designed for web maps. Um, and it's in the Mercator version that we normally see. If this is not an option clickable here, you can search for Web Mercator. And as you start typing in the filter box, um, it filters through all the many thousands of coordinate systems to return just things that match. So you can select it from here and then click OK. And suddenly we see that the United States looks a lot more, you know, the, the shape that we expect to see it in. So I think this is a good choice for my web map and I'm happy with that. All right, so we've done the kind of like basic setup. We've added a, some data, we've added a base map, we've changed the projection so it looks nice. I'm gonna save my project. Always something I forget to reference or, or mention to people. Um, so I'm going to name it um, Parking. And you'll notice that I'm working in a dedicated folder for this project. And I also created a folder just for this demo. Um, data organization is something I talk about in the Learn the Basics workshop, but just a friendly reminder that using folders will help you down the line. And naming things um, so that they make sense to you also is helpful. You might, instead of calling it working, actually I realize maybe Sunlight Workshop makes more sense. So I know that this is the one I created for the workshop. Okay, I'll click save. All right, now if I get disconnected or my QGIS crashes, I'll be able to open my project and start where we left off, which is great. All right, the next thing I wanna do, and I encourage everyone always, before you start playing around and getting lost in the kind of nitty gritty of map design, is to try to understand what data you are working with. We already looked at the CSV, but as I mentioned, the shapefile has some extra fields. So let's take a look at that by opening the attribute table. All right, so as we saw in the CSV file, we have rows of data. There are 990 of them, so that's 990 points. Um, the attributes that they have in here are city name, state ID, full state name, some other kind of numeric information, time zone, um, and then we have all of the other things that we saw in the CSV plus these three extra fields. So what I did to prepare this was I took the day length, which is the number of hours in the day um, of sunlight, number of hours of sunlight, and I translated it or, or configured it so it isn't many, many, many decimal points, which is not really easy for the human eye to read. And I made it so that the field only had a precision of one, meaning one decimal point. Um, that's going to look a lot nicer in a pop-up. So I'm already kind of thinking ahead to like, what is the format I want my data to look like? when I'm designing my web map. I also created these other fields, which are essentially ways of categorizing the data. I came about this 
retroactively or retrospectively when I was playing with the QGIS to web tool, I realized it could not do all of the things I wanted to do. We'll see that in a moment. Um, so for example, when I wanted to kind of group categories, like I wanted in my, in my static map, I grouped a bunch of these sunset times so that everything that is before 4.15 or so um, is grouped together into a category that I labeled before 4.15. And the plugin couldn't really do that. So what I did is I created a new column with the kind of category name in there. So everything here I labeled 415 and that's the max sunset time. And then I also did that for 430 and so on and so on. So that's gonna make it easier for us when it comes time to creating a web map. So these are all the fields that you can play with on your own um, and you can decide how you want to display these um, and what symbology you want to apply. So let us, try to play around with that a little bit. All right, so I'm gonna open the properties for this layer and go into the symbology tab. It opened right there for me because that must've been the last thing I was working on. And I'm going to change the symbology type from single symbol to let's say categorized. Let's say I'm interested in looking at some of the categories of data. And when I choose this, it only gives me the options to select from fields that have categorical data which is quite a lot of them, or things that could be categorized. Um, so for example, let us look at the time zone categories. And if I click the button classify, it will look in the attribute table and retrieve all of the unique values from that field. And so we see that we have all of these different values and we have a legend, which I could change if I don't want it to say America Boise, but just Boise, I could change that. Um, and when I click apply, we will see that it updated my legend, all right. Um, we can also change the colors that are applied to this. Right now it's random, but maybe I want it to be drawing from this turbo option. I'll click apply and it just updates them. I can also change the base symbol. So it's not two, but let's say four millimeters in size. Click okay, click apply. There we go, cool. So that's a map I can make. I can make a web map of this. Time zones in the United States. I don't actually know what's going on with these ones. Um, if anybody here knows more about this, please feel free to chime in. Why is Arizona its own? I don't know. What's going on with these cities down here? I'm not sure. Um, I didn't fact check that these time zones were correct. I just downloaded this from the internet. So maybe that could be something I'd want to check before I make this public. Um, what other things we might want to symbolize? Let's see. Let's look at that, um, that field that I was talking about trying to explain that sunset category. <clears throat> so if I click that and then click again, classify, it's going to ask me, do you want to erase all of the things that we already have in there? Yes, I do. And so we see that these are the categories. I'm going to click apply. And already this should look kind of similar to the map that I created um, in that workshop. I'm gonna use the same color spectrum that I used before and remove this all other values. I don't, I don't want that to take away from my nice dark purple to yellow spectrum. So I'm gonna remove that and apply that color scheme again. There we go. Now it's dark purple to yellow, click apply. And this should look basically the same, um, at least in terms of color. Uh, so what's happening here is that all of these things with this very dark black or purple, um, they have a sunset time somewhere before 4.15. So I'm going to update that legend before 4.15. Um, and that means that the rest of them are ranges, 4.15 to 4.30, 4.30 to 4.45, and so on. can't tell you how long it took me to figure out in QGIS how to change legend items. I think it's the same as an ArcGIS, but um, you know, some things are just so slightly different or hard to learn. Um, and then this one, I'm just going to change to after 5.45 PM because I want to click apply again. It didn't change the color at all, but it changed the labels in my legend. So now if I were to make a map, it's going to pull those, you know, legend items. 
All right, cool. So let's say I'm interested in that. Um, and the web map that I created was showing us kind of just point locations. One of the kind of drawbacks of the QGIS to web tool, I noticed, you cannot display two variables at once. What do I mean by that? Right now, we are using symbology to apply a color based on one field. In a lot of maps, like the static one that I made, it's possible to show both color and size to convey information about two different fields. What does this look like? I'm gonna duplicate my layer and show you. Okay, so here's my copy. Um, this was one of the things that I didn't know how to do in QGIS until I was preparing for this workshop. So that was really exciting. So you start with QGIS by using a categor categorical value like sunset times. To apply something based on numerical data like population, we're going to change the symbol. Um, so if I click on the symbol, um, instead of changing the size here, I'm going to click on this button on the right-hand side and open the assistant. And this is basically asking you, what is the second field that you want to use to, to change the size, to make the size variable? And the field I want to use is population. I'm gonna click this kind of fetch circular button to retrieve the minimum and maximum values from that field. And I can also change the size. So the smallest is one, I might make it two because one might be too small that you can't see the color. And I can go as high as I want. I'm gonna use 18. Um, and I'm gonna change the scale method to surface. Honestly, I can't tell you why. It seemed to look nice when I did it. Um, one drawback to this method is I can't reduce the number of circles. It's, it's just kind of like a, a range. It's not like categories. It's ranging from two to 18. So I'll click okay. I'll click okay again. I'll click apply and get ready. Let's see, when I click apply, we see it's now changing the size of those circles based on the population. So this is now looking quite like the map I made. Um, that was a static map. One of the powers of static maps, you can show two variables at once. With the QGIS to web plugin, you cannot. For some reason, it did not work. Um, and so my workaround for that was simply just to choose for my web map to show one variable sunset time and rely on users ability to click on items in order to find out more information like population. So that is one drawback. I could also do two layers. Um, I could have a layer for with color showing sunset time and I could do a second layer showing population. So I'm going to try doing that for our demo. Um, data management practice, hot tip. I'm going to start renaming my layers so I know what they are. So this layer is US City's sunset. And if I make a copy of it, I'm going to call it US City's population. And I'm going to change the way it looks from a categorical data type to graduated. All right. And I'm gonna draw from that population field Again, I'm gonna click classify. I'm going to change the method. I, I want it to kind of be scalar based on size and I'll go with those same minimum maximum values. And let's change the classes, maybe eight of them. How does that look? That does not look good. <laughs> I'm gonna experiment and try some more. All right, another hot tip. Um, when you're doing a, a graduated symbology using numerical data, you can also change the way those sizes appear by changing the mode. So right now equal count means it's trying to fit the same number of circles into each grouping. But actually for population, I don't really want that. I want the sizes to be more reflective of the actual underlying data. Um, if I did, for example, equal interval, I'm realizing that's actually not great either because most cities are really small in this data set. So for the purposes of my pretty map, I'm going to choose natural break, natural breaks, jinks, um, which honestly, I don't really understand quite super well how it works, um, but it is really nice for map making. If you don't care very much about 
there being equal numbers in each bracket. How does this look? Starting to look okay. All right. Do, do, do. What if I make it bigger? All right, at this point, you can just play around basically forever until you are happy with the way your map looks. That's pretty good as showing us the hot spots of population. I'm also gonna change the symbol. I don't really want it to be purple for this. Um, I think I'll pick white maybe. There we go. Uh, or another color. You can pick whatever you want. Blue, blue it is. All right, so now we have a population layer. So right now I've got a sunset times layer and I have a population layer. Um, and I'm gonna get rid of this extra one that I made showing, I won't get rid of it. I will rename it so I know what it is. US cities, sunset and population. All right, cool. So we already talked about base map choices. Um, the next step, once I have the layers that I'm like happy with, I know that these two layers are the layers I want to put in my web map. I also wanna pick a base map. Um, what I chose when I was doing this for the demo was this Positron uh, no labels version, which again comes from the CartoDB contributed pack. Um, but you can choose whatever base map you want. If you want it to be this, if you want to use a base map that is say the Google satellite, you totally can, um, whatever base map you want. I will warn you that sometimes, uh, depending on the contributor and whoever's offering this web service, it might not export super well um, using the, the QGIS to web plugin. So it's just a matter of testing and making sure that it works before you actually post it online. But I know this one works, so I'm gonna go with that. All right, how are we with time? At this point, does anybody have any questions before I move on to the QGIS to web plugin? Stop sharing for a second. I don't see it. Oh, how do you how do you copy a map? What do you mean by that? Could you clarify? Like, how did I copy the layers? Okay. Was it the layer that you were wondering about? I can show how I copied the layer. All right, let me share my screen again. All right, so if I'm working here and I have, let's say this US cities sunset layer, let's say it's the only one I'm looking at, and I just wanna make a copy of it. If I right click that layer, there's an option in the menu to duplicate the layer. Um, there is also the possibility to copy it, I wonder if that will work. I have not tried that. So if I click copy and then right click paste, oh, that's another way to do it. So that made another, or I can click duplicate layer and that duplicates it also. So those are the two ways you can very quickly just like make a copy of a layer that includes all of the way you, you've symbolized it and your legend properties and everything like that. Awesome, cool. Okay, so I'm going to just take a moment and make sure that my web map layers are all here. They're named appropriately. I'm gonna save my project again. And at this point, I'm going to move on to that section of the workshop, which I recommended you, you check out that extra tutorial on how to use this plugin, because there's a lot more in there. And there's also a lot of resources on the QJS to web GitHub repo um, for ways to customize this tool. I'm doing something very simple and there might be other things that you're able to do with it that I'm not showing you today. Okay, so just like with the Quick Map Services plugin, um, you will go to the Manage and Install Plugins menu and search for QGIS to web. That's two with a, the number two. 
and you'll click install plugin. Once it is installed, you will see it in the web menu just above quick map services, there is QGIS to web. So if I click create web map that opens the plugin. All right, what this plugin is doing <laughs> is taking all my layers and it's going to output a whole bunch of files that are in CSS, which is um, like a, a style sheet kind of language that web applications use to style things like font and colors. Um, there might be some JavaScript files. JavaScript is a language that's used to handle things like clicking and pop-up behavior, things that are interactive. Um, there will also be an HTML file. HTML is the language that web browsers use to render a page out of just a whole bunch of code. You don't need to know how to write in any of those languages or even read them. Um, if you do know how to read or write in those languages, you could then customize them further. That's one of the cool things about this plugin is it generates the base stuff for you. And then it's possible to go in and kind of tweak the stuff um, and make it even further customized, especially if the plugin doesn't do something you want it to do. So there's basically this wizard here that walks you through all the different steps um, to turn your map into those files. Um, but the first thing that I recommend you do is go to the help tab, which I really think should be the first tab because it has a whole lot of information about what to do to get started and to make sure your project is ready to be exported. Um, so key here, prepare your map as far as possible. And here are specific tasks that you wanna do to improve your web map. So first things first is set your project title and background and highlight colors. And we can get to this through the project, project properties menus. So project, project properties. If I go to the general tab, I see that there's a possibility for me to give this a project title. So I'm gonna call this sunlight workshop demo. You can call it whatever you want. Um, selection color is by default yellow. I'm gonna pick bright red and the background color, just so that we can see what it does in the application. I'm gonna pick, um, it's kind of like pale orange. Okay. All of a sudden you might've noticed that my project, the title of my QGIS project up here in this top bar, which I can't see because of the zoom tools, it's now called Sunlight Workshop Demo. So the file name is still, if I look at it in my, my hard drive, it's still sunlightworkshop.qgz, but since we added a title, it's now up, like, updating it here. Okay, cool. We did that. Next, give your layers human-friendly names in the layers panel. Actually, I already did that. Um, not even intentionally, but I've renamed them. Um, and to rename a layer, you will right click it and go to rename layer. This allows you to change how it's going to appear. This is how it's going to appear in your web map. So important to give it a name that like somebody who's viewing your web map will be able to interpret and make sense of without having to understand it or read something. So. So maybe I wanna rename it something like US cities population. And actually, I'm not sure sunset makes sense. Sunset time. Okay, I'm gonna save my project. All right, next, it recommends to give your layer columns human friendly names. Again, that's um, the attribute table, what each field is called. And we can do this through layer properties fields alias. Okay. So I'm going to open um, the properties for one of my layers and go to the fields menu, layers, property, fields, alias. Yeah. Okay. This is what I found out. I, in my version of QGIS, I'm not able to update the alias in here. I'm not sure if that's something everybody can't do. Um, so what I found is that if you go in the attributes form, Instead, this is a place where you can change the alias. So we see uh, in this menu, this is where we were in symbology before, we'll go down to attributes form and select one of the fields and I can give it a different alias. And what this means is again in the web map, when I clicked on a city, 
and I saw it read city, you know, Boise or something like that. It was reading with a capital C and that's because I had changed the alias to be capital C city. And I'm going to do that for any fields that I think I'm going to want to appear in my pop-up. So maybe my state ID, I also want to just read state. People don't need to know it's the field name is state underscore ID. They just want to know that it's the state. Uh, if I'm going to want the population value to be there, I might put that in the alias. Density, um, I might actually rename this pop density. You know, whatever you think is going to make sense to your viewer. You can also have special characters and spaces in the alias, which you cannot have in the field names. So that's pretty cool. Let's say I want the time zone, I'm gonna capital T time zone and sunset, sunrise and sunset short. This is an abbreviated version of the word short is the human readable time. Um, that I designed. So I would like those also to be in my attribute tape, um, sorry, my pop-up. So I'm going to rename those just to sunrise and sunset. And I also know that I'm going to want these last three columns. So daylight in hours, max population, And max sunset would be like latest sunset time. All right, I'm gonna click apply. Don't forget to do that and then okay. And that should save the, the changes you made. All right, next, hide the columns you don't want to appear in your pop-ups, hmm. <laughs> which I have a lot of fields I don't want to appear in the pop-ups by changing their edit widget, widget to hidden. So we do that in that same place um, in that attributes form. So for example, I don't want state name. So I'm gonna change the widget type to hidden. I don't want latitude to show up, hidden or longitude. Population we do want, density we do want, time zone. We don't want the long versions of sunrise and sunset. Those are um, very difficult things to read. Um, they're like formatted in UTC, which does not make sense to humans. So I'm going to hide them. Those we want. I don't think I want these longer versions of day length and night length, because if you remember, those are like fields that have lots and lots and lots of decimal points. So I'm going to hide them. All right, and click apply. Okay. Next, if any of your fields contain image file names, which we don't, there are instructions for how to handle that. Um, next, it says to style your lab labels, um, which we have done already. And I think that's all we need to do to get ready. Um, I just realized, however, with my US cities population layer, I have to repeat that process in the attributes form and you know, give them aliases and everything. But because these are identical layers, the only difference is I've changed the way the symbology is. I'm just gonna save myself a moment and duplicate the sunset time layer because that should have preserved, yep, it preserved all of the changes I made to the fields in the attribute form. And now I'm gonna, this is pretty fun, watch this. I'm going to, copy the symbology from the layer I already stylized for population and paste it into this one. This is a cool thing that, um, that QGIS can do. I'm not sure if ArcGIS can do this, maybe it can. So if I right click the layer and go to styles, copy style, these are all of the things I can copy about that layer. I'm gonna copy the symbology. Now I go to this layer and I go to styles, paste style. The only option I can do is symbology paste it. Sure enough, it has just brought in the same symbology for that layer. So now I can get rid of that other layer that I created before and rename this so I know what it is. All right. Okay, we covered just a lot right now. That was all getting ready, prepping to use the QGIS to web plugin. Do we have any questions about that? Check in the chat.
checking the time. All right, I think we're probably ready to go ahead and use that plugin, which is what we're all here for, I think. So I'm gonna share my screen again. Save my project one more time, can never save enough. And I'm going to open that plugin from the web menu, create a web map. And we already did everything on the help page. So fingers crossed this goes well. <laughs> this is always fun. So we see in the layers and groups tab, anything that's checked are layers that will be exported with a web map. So we see US cities sunset time, US cities population, and down here, the positron layer, which actually I should rename that. I'm going to rename that right now because that is not a really nice name. I'm going to call it Carto DB to give them attribution positron. Okay, now let's get started. All right, so now we see that's been updated there. Um, and everything else that is unchecked will not be exported with my web map. Um, the next thing we can do is change things like, do we want this layer to be visible? Yes. Do we want there to be pop-ups with it? Yes. And for the pop-up fields, um, let me show you. If I click update preview, it will pull in all the layers so we see like a preview of our, of our web map. If I zoom in and click one of those points, it's not letting me do that. I'm not sure why. Hmm, maybe I need to change that. Pop-ups. Well, for now I'm gonna turn on show pop-ups on hover. No, it's not working. Hmm, I know why, okay. Um, down at the very bottom, this is another fun thing about the um, QGIS to web plugin. We can choose to export our files in three different kind of like languages. Um, the open layers, I don't know if that's a language, but whatever uh, version, leaflet and Mapbox GL JS for JavaScript. I'm going to use leaflet. Um, that's the one I'm most comfortable with. There are a lot of tutorials about leaflet files. Um, it's open source, it's super great. That's the one I'm gonna use for this demo. Feel free to experiment with the others. If I click update preview now, hopefully we will see, ha ha now, yeah, I'm gonna turn off that hover. We don't want to hover. Okay, now we should see the responsivity that I was hoping for. If I click, we see a pop-up, beautiful leaflet all the way. Um, and so what these labels mean right now, it's saying there will be no label telling the first row, like the person in the pop-up that this is city. So I'm gonna change that to inline and let's see what happens when I do that. Now, when I click on something, we see city, rapid city. So I'm going to go ahead and use inline labels for everything so that people can see or interpret the information in that pop-up. Okay, update preview. Ta-da, there we go. So now we can see that the pop-ups all have this label associated with them. And it's the label we put into that alias field, right? So that's why we can see however we stylized it. I'm gonna do that also for my US cities population layer. I want them to have inline labels as well. And under my base map layer, right now it's visible and pop-ups. I'm just gonna disable pop-ups because I don't want people to query the base map. I don't even know if they can. Um, anyway, I'm gonna click update preview and it's just kind of like updating everything. All right, next we can go to the appearance tab. So, um, ooh, right, add abstract. Uh, this is a thing that I don't think the help page mentioned, but if you go back into the project properties where we added a title, you can also change um, the abstract in the metadata tab. So we can put some information about this map. Like this is a web map designed for a workshop in March, 2022 to show sunset times and population in the 990 largest cities in the continental or the contigu contiguous 48. 
you can put whatever you want. You could put attribute um, credits. You could say you designed it. You could put your name and contact information. You could put credits for the data set. That I actually strongly recommend if you're using other people's data, um, which I've done in the live version of my web map. So I have links to Simple Maps and the Sunset Sunrise Sunset API. I'm not going to do that right now, but that's where you would put it. All right, so now um, we can say we want to add an abstract. You can say where you want it to be. Um, maybe the upper right corner, lower right corner, and I'm going to update the preview. And so by adding an abstract right now, it's just kind of like floating there in a box. Um, I don't remember how to make that <clears throat> smaller, like a pop out. We'll work on it. So anyway, I've added an abstract. Um, you can add an address search. What that does, I just checked the add address search. It allows people to type in an address here. Um, I'm not going to do that for my particular web map, but that's something you could do. You can also add a layers list, and I'm going to pick collapsed. And what that does is allows users to turn on and off the layers. And you see that it's bringing in the legend that we styled. So I like that. And you can either have it collapsed so that people hover over it and it pops out, or you can pick expanded, and then it's just there, expanded. I didn't mean to do that. This is how it would look if it was expanded. I personally like the collapsed option, so I'm going to do that. And then we have this attribute filter. And this is something that I think is super helpful. We saw this in the web map I made. I made. Um, it allows people to filter out the points that are visible in the web map. So if I want max sunset and max pop to be filters, for example, now people can kind of filter out those max population groupings or they can select just things that have a max sunset time. That's pretty neat. Actually, I think I'm gonna keep max sunset and not use max pop, but instead use regular pop. I don't want to use the groups I made. I want people to query the full population data. And you can also put the state ID in here. So let's see what we get now. Great. So now people can filter by population, like the raw data, or those sunset groups, or the state. All right. I like that. Interestingly, this is not something maybe I didn't test. I'm not sure why these are not bringing in the names that I renamed them from the aliases. Something to look into. All right. You can click a geolocate user option. This means that when somebody clicks on that button, it asks, are we allowed to use your location? And if they say yes, then it will zoom to their position in the map. Um, and then highlight on hover, I think is a fun option right now without it applied. As I move my cursor over the map, nothing's happening, seemingly. Um, if I update the preview with, geo, with highlight on hover turned on, now you see it's highlighting my points with that highlight color I picked. I picked red. Red might not have been the best choice, but you can see how that's working. Cool. Uh, layer search. I'm going to put on layer search, and this allows people to search a layer. Um, and field within that layer. So let's say I want people to be able to query the city name. So I'll choose that. And now we have this, this little binoculars icon and that allows somebody to type in say Boston and it searches for Boston and well, it, it pans, pans to it, I guess. There we go. So there, that's one way to get people to be able to interact with the map. Wow, there's a lot of options in here. We can turn on a measuring tool. Um, we can have those pop-ups show on hover rather than having to click on it. It can just appear. Um, template, I'm not really sure what those things are. Let's try canvas size. I don't know what it's gonna do. Ooh, I'm not sure I like whatever canvas size is. I'm gonna go with full screen, okay. And widget background, I can choose a different color for my widget background. 
<laughs> so it made all of these blue. Okay, that's cool. You can change the color of the widgets as well. Um, like, I don't know what that would do. What happens if I do that and make the text white? I don't know. Oh, neat. Okay. Um, we can also change the default extent. So you noticed every time I click update preview, it's kind of like zooming and panning to a specific extent. Um, so I could change that, maybe like fit to layers extent. I don't know what that's going to do. There. So that zooms in to the extent. Unfortunately, my sidebar is kind of interfering with the right side of my map. So you can play around with that a little bit <laughs> if you want um, and see what is best for you. This is, these are also things you can change in the files yourselves if you have coding ability. You can go in and change the stuff there. Max zoom level, min zoom level, cool. All right, pretty happy with this so far. Um, next we have, let's see. I realized going back here right now, by default, if somebody opens my web map, they're going to see both layers turned on by default, but I want them to be able to just see one at a time and then come in here and turn them on and off. So I'm going to uncheck city population visible on the layers and groups menu and see if that does what I'm hoping it will do. It does. All right, so now somebody could come in here and turn on the city's population layer, but it is not a layer that is turned on by default. All right, I think, getting to the point where I'm pretty happy with this web map. So the next thing to do is to export it. And I really recommend doing this. Just, you know, try to configure it as best you can, do an export, and then you can test it and make sure it looks the way you expect. You can always come back and do another export. So we just have to tell it where to save this on our computer by clicking the three dots icon. <clears throat> and navigate to wherever you are saving your files. Um, so I have this QGIS to web dedicated folder. You can see I made a couple other exports and how it names them, has the date and time, I guess. So I'm just gonna click open and click, what, what is under the settings? Yeah, it's fine, I'm gonna click export. Woohoo, it was successful. <laughs> And now the fun part is actually testing it to make sure it works. So if we go to that export, that folder that just got exported, we see it has all of these different folders. There's a folder for CSS files. There's a folder for the data layers that have been transformed into JS files. Um, we have some images, which I'm not sure what they use them for in this web map, but they will be used. We have a JavaScript folder some stuff related to the legend. There's nothing in the markers folder and there's a couple of things in the web fonts. And the key thing is our index file. If I open this with a text editor, that didn't work. Okay, if I open this with a coding software like Atom, this is, this is a little more advanced for people who know how to kind of edit code. This is what is in the HTML file. It's written in the HTML language. This is what a web browser is going to use to create a web map. It's telling the browser all about how to style these things, you know, where, what elements will be on the web map. You're having a pane for this and a panel for the legend and so on. This is what's in that HTML file. You don't need to be able to understand it in order for this to work. Now, once this is exported, this is like its own package. This works as an entity. References in the index file point to these folders. So if I just double click this HTML file, it should open in a web browser and it should be a web map. There it is. This is a web map. It exists on my computer in that folder that I just created. It has all the interactivity that we saw in the kind of preview pane. I can zoom in. I can query things, I can apply those filters. I can apply these filters. The only thing I'm not happy with this web map because I have not figured out yet is why my labels here did not pull from the aliases. That is something for me to think about later. And if you have this problem, you might wanna look into it as well. Um, and at this point, 
We have finished using the QGIS to web plugin. Congratulations. Um, the next step after this is to now actually share this web map with the world. And we're going to use GitHub to do that because GitHub is free also. Um, but we're going to take a break. Um, so I'm going to be here, but please feel free to take a break. We'll come back at 1.32 for the rest of the workshop. Let me know if you have any questions. I think you are muted. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a nice break. Um, so the session runs until 2.15. We're right on time, which is super great. So in this last part, um, we're, I'm going to show you how to get those files we just created with the QGIS to web plugin into GitHub and use um, GitHub pages, which is a kind of like amazing functionality of GitHub to just create a URL um, that hosts those pages. And what we're going to see at the end, I will share my screen, um, will be exactly what we're seeing right here, um, which is a locally hosted web map, but we will see it um, with a URL that we can then share with people uh, because it will be posted in GitHub. All right. So again, the workshop exercise, which you all have a link to, um, we're now on to step four, upload the files to GitHub. Um, so the instructions are here and there are a couple of screenshots to help you walk through this particular part of the kind of exercise um, because uh, this was not included in the, um, in the other tutorial, which I, Again, strongly recommend. <laughs> this does not go into how to host this then in GitHub. So that is what this is about. All right, so to get started, um, you will go to github.com. If you already have an account, awesome. If you don't, uh, it will look like this and you'll be invited to sign up for GitHub. GitHub is free, so you can use whatever email address you want and sign up. Um, once you sign in, you'll be taken to this kind of like basic page. I don't know what a page would look like for somebody who's totally new to it, um, but you can navigate to your own kind of like profile up in the upper right corner and go to your profile. And if you are totally new to GitHub, you probably won't see anything here, um, but that's okay. If you are involved in GitHub, you'll see some things. So we want to create a new repository. Um, how to do that. Maybe if we go to your repositories or just click repositories right up here in the top, you'll be able to create a new one. So we see that I already made one for this project because that's the web map linked in the website. Um, but I'm going to create a new one for the purposes of this demo so that we can see how to do that together. All right, so we'll click new. And you're invited to kind of fill out this fun little wizard, how to create a new repository. Um, you can uh, pick a different template. I think that might only work if you're a member of an organization that has other templates. So you don't need to do that. Um, you'll just give it a name and it has to be a name that is unique to your space. So since I already have one called Sunlight in the US, I can't give it that name again. If I try, It tells me this account already has something with that name. So I'm going to give it a different name. For the purposes of this demo, I'm going to call it workshop demo. Um, and I'll probably delete the repo afterwards. But anyway, <laughs> um, they give you some tips here, something short and memorable. You can give it a description. The description is what's going to show up on the main repo in the upper right corner. Just a brief something to let people know. So web map, sign for a workshop on web maps in March 2022. You can optionally choose to make this a private repo, but if you do, the URL function will not work. So essentially, you have to choose public if you're intending to make a public web map. Um, some other things you can start the repo with. Um, we can add a readme file. Um, the git ignore I don't think is necessary for the purposes of what we're doing. We don't need to really know it 
choosing a license is also a good idea. Um, if you want to let people know whether they can reuse your stuff or not. Um, so I might choose, I'm a fan of the Creative Commons um, attribution license, which is not one of the options on here. So what I might do is create my repo without a license and then paste the license into it later um, that I get from another repo. If you want attribution, the options here, they're really pushing people towards don't even have to, to attribute, just like anyone can use it for any purposes you want. And if you're cool with that, then pick one of those. Um, this general public license, for example, is a good choice. Um, and you can Google these if you're curious about what the different licenses mean. It seems like this link might tell us some more about the licensing. Yes, how to choose the right license, et cetera. Okay, and I'm gonna add a readme file. Readme files are really great, as we'll see in a moment. Then I'm gonna click create repository. Ta-da, we see I have a license that I chose, which when I click on it is in fact the license I selected from the dropdown. And we have a readme file. This is the readme file. It appears on the home page of your repository. We are right now in the workshop demo repository in my GitHub space. So my GitHub space slash the repo name. And anyone who goes to this will see the readme file. So it is very helpful to have one so that you can add more information. Um, and we do that, I did not say how, by clicking the little pencil icon. This allows me to edit the contents of that. So I can rename it, workshop, demo. Um, I can add more content. I could say, made by me. Uh, you know, you can, this, the styling, what we're seeing here with the hashtag and things like that, that is something called markdown. So if you're not familiar with markdown and you Google markdown, you'll find lots of guides to help you know how to use it. So for example, a hashtag means it's a heading level one, two hashtags means um, heading level two. And if I click preview, we'll see what that means. So this is heading level one, this is heading level two. Um, and whatever. Okay. Oh, nice. Thank you, Sasha. Sasha posted something about how to format uh, text in Markdown. All right. So now I can kind of preview and make sure I like what's in my readme file. Ideally, you'll have more content than this. And when I'm done, um, I'm going to GitHub uses this uh, language of committing changes, like committing. So I've made these changes and do I want to make them, it's like saving, do I want to make them real in my repo? Um, it's highly recommended to add some information to let your future self know what changes you made. By default, it's putting a general like update readme. I might put in there like change title and added data sources, something like that, something brief and short. And then I have the option to commit directly to the main branch. That's like the core live code that'll make it real and live right away. Um, or I can create a new branch. Let's not think about that now. If you're new to GitHub, don't worry about branches right now. We're just gonna commit directly to the main. So I'm gonna click commit changes. Ta-da. Now when I go to that repo landing page, we'll see that the changes I made are now live. Awesome. We also see that that blurb that I put in when I created the repo is appearing in the upper right corner as well as some other basic information about it. Okay. Uh, so now we need to add our files. And it's as simple as taking all of the outputs that the QGIS to web plugin created and putting them into our repo. So I'm going to click add file and upload files. And now I can either choose them from my directory or I can just drag and drop them all just like this. And you can see it's uploading them and it's preserving the folder structure. So everything I had in the CSS folder is going to go into a CSS folder here in my repo, um, which is exactly what we need in order for the web map to function correctly. You can see it's listing all of the files as it's uploading them. There's lots of them. 
All right. And now when we're all done, we see that these are all the files that are going to get uploaded. We see the folder that they're going to live in and the file name. And again, commit changes. I can put a little brief note here to let me know, like maybe initial upload of QGIS to web files. Um, the reason why I'm saying this to myself is what I've found is if I decide to make a change into the QGIS to web kind of out, like export, if I want to export it again, I might replace some of these files in the future. And so I can keep editing the files in this repo. I don't have to create a whole new repo. I can replace the files that are in there. And so I'm going to want to use commit memos that make sense to me when I look back. We want to click commit changes. And it's taking a few minutes. In the meantime, in the, while that's working, I'm going to show you the repo for the web map that I already created. So we see that this is what it's going to look like when it's done. We're going to have all of that, those files uploaded from the QGIS to web plugin. We see that the readme I made for this is a little bit longer and it has some links that I built in so that people can access those data sources. Um, I have, yeah, it's just a little bit more fleshed out. Yeah, so that's a great question. There's a question in the chat. Um, whose servers are these files in GitHub being deposited to and for how long? If anybody else knows the answer to that question, please chime in. Um, GitHub is its own company organization. I can't remember who, who purchased it, if it's Microsoft. Um, so this is a cloud repository. We're uploading these files to a server somewhere else. So yeah, if you're working with like private or sensitive data, GitHub is not going to be a good solution for you for hosting data because we don't really have control over the security. Um, for how long? Theoretically forever, um, practically for as long as GitHub exists and continues to operate on a, having with a free tier. Um, I think GitHub does have more like pay tiers for people who are doing a lot in here and hosting a lot of data. But for that reason, a general good practice is to not put a lot like you don't want really large files in your GitHub repo. I don't know what the limits are, but there are limits. Um, so it's really good for lightweight things like web maps, which are essentially just text files. Um, you, can, you can put web maps in GitHub, probably can't put research data in GitHub. Would love it if other people have other ideas to contribute. Okay, 100 megabyte limit, thank you, yeah. <clears throat> Again, web maps are just text files, not so big. Let me just double check without, <laughs> without double checking, I don't know. So how big is the export from QGIS to web? It is 1.6 megabytes. So that is what I just put into my GitHub repo. All right, so when we go back to it, we see it has just completed. We see it's, if we look at the file folder structure um, here, Comparing the GitHub to my folder, we see a folder for CSS, one for data, images, there's a JS, legend, web fonts. It did not upload markers because there's nothing in there. Um, and we have the index file. Beautiful, it's got everything there. We also see next to each folder, the, the memo of the commit that I saved. So it's telling whoever looks at my repo that the last change made to this folder was two minutes ago, and this was the commit message. So the last change made to license was made eight minutes ago, and that was the initial message. All right. So next, the next step to do basics, we have everything ready. We're now ready to make this public. So we're going to go into the settings panel for this repo and go down to the pages page, a page called pages. Um, and now um, what it's going to do is basically take all the files that are in our repo and spin them up into a URL. And because the files that we're uploading are designed to be read as a page, it just works. It's like magic, it's amazing. Um, so it says that GitHub Pages is currently disabled. If I want to enable it, I have to select a branch. And there's only one branch, main. 
Perfect. Very easy. And then I just click save. Ta-da. That is all you have to do. It says now that your site is ready to be published. If I go to that URL right away, it says site not found. That's because it can take a couple minutes for GitHub to spin up a URL, but this will be the location of my, of my web map. Um, again, looking at the one I already made, if I go to that URL, that is the URL for the web map. There it is. So that is what we're going to see once GitHub gets done with whatever it's doing, the magic behind the scenes. Um, and I can refresh this page while I'm waiting. And eventually we will see like a green success message saying your page is now published. Um, yeah. So that is what I have for this workshop. Um, at this point, we have about 30 minutes left in the scheduled workshop time. So I'd love to open this up to um, Q&A. Also, if anyone has other ideas or things to contribute. Also, if you want to try this exercise on your own, um, and then if you have questions as they come up, I'm here to help you out. So I'm gonna keep this room open for, two, for half an hour more. Um, and I just wanna thank you all for attending. And I hope that you continue to come to the GIS workshops that we at the libraries are offering. Thanks so much. <laughs>